have already sung the story and hope of the scriptures. We have praised the name of our Lord for the centerpiece of it all, the cross and our Lord's victory over sin and death for us. Uh, But today we're going to focus on this story. And I want us to ask ourselves, what is our story? What is your story? How would you tell someone your story if you were going to communicate that to your neighbor, to your friend at a family dinner? What's your story? What is your story? Many of our neighbors today would would say something like what uh, Macbeth said in the fifth act of, of that play by Shakespeare. He would say that life, that our story is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That if you asked a neighbor, what is your story? Well, it's just meaningless. There's three basic elements of a story or character, plot, and setting. For many of us, who are the the characters in our story? Well, I guess it's me and whoever doesn't really matter. What's the plot? Well, there's no plot. It's just I'm here, we're here, and then we're gone. There's no story. What's the setting? We may not even think about the fact of where we are, of this world around us, the place where we live. The scriptures have a different way, though, of orienting us to the world, a different way of inviting us to tell our story. That's fundamentally what the scriptures are. These 66 books are not just disjointed. They actually connect together to tell one unified story of hope. And this story, I I like to think of it kind of like a two-box set. If you had a Blu-ray DVD of the scriptures, it'd be like you'd have the movie, which would be a bit long, but a good one, be epic. And then you'd have your extra features on your second disc. So it'd be two two two-disc sets. In the Older Testament, you have your your story, your movie that goes from Genesis, from the beginning of all things, God creating the heavens and the earth, to forming a people, giving them a place, a kingdom, seeing that kingdom shattered and that people removed from their land and they're wondering if they have any hope. That goes from Genesis through Esther. Then you get the soundtrack of God's people. In disc two, the special features, you get the Psalms of God's people, you get the wisdom of God, you get the prophets who spoke in at different moments in the story. And then, of course, we have all of that story fulfilled in Jesus, and that's in box two. So disc one of box two is gonna have your movie, The Gospels and Acts, the story of Jesus Christ and sending his apostles out in the power of the Spirit to the ends of the earth, even to Larimer County, Colorado. And then you have the extra features. You have letters. You get to read other people's mail. You get to read the letters of Paul, of John, of James, of Jude, of Peter, and a prophecy, a revelation of things that are yet to come given to people in the first century wondering where God is. They were in suffering. And so Jesus had a special revelation for them of hope. Even in that moment, the scriptures reveal a story, the story of hope. I would suggest to you, though, that most Christians struggle to grasp this story and this hope. And if they were to tell the story, the Christian story, they might not tell the fullness. They might not grasp the robustness. And they might not live as characters in God's story of hope on the day to day. And it's partially for this reason that some of our neighbors who reject Christianity, may not be rejecting the actual thing. They may not be rejecting the actual story of hope, the actual God of this story of hope, in all of its robust truth and grace. And so today, as we enter into Advent, as we think about the story of Christ who came to save us, we're going to ask, what story is that even a part of? What story are we a part of? Who's the hero What's the plot? What's the setting? And does it matter? We're going to see that this story of hope that we're invited to be a part of is the story of hope because God created all things and even us for relationship with himself. So let's take a moment. We're going to pray and then we'll, we'll dig into this story and hopefully find ourselves in it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story the great story 
of, of your love that never quits. Lord, I pray that you would take hold of our hearts today, that you would help us to inhabit this world and your story well for your glory. For those of us with questions, I pray that you'd help to show dear ones who are hurting, who, who, have, who have sincere doubts about the faith, that in this story, their doubts are accounted for and they can find welcome, they can find purpose in your kingdom and in this unfolding plan that you have for us. We just praise you for this and ask that you would meet us now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm gonna do something that's uh, not a good idea. I'm gonna try to preach the whole Bible in a sermon. And we're gonna start in Genesis one, so please open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter one. And uh, we'll start in the beginning because that's where every good story begins. Well, some begin in Medias Ray, but that's fine. We, we're gonna start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want us to take a moment and think about this story as we orient ourselves to God's story. The first people that heard that telling of the beginning of all things were nomadic shepherds who had just been brought out of 400 plus years of slavery in Egypt. And they're gathered together, perhaps at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they're seeing this appearance of God flashing in dark clouds, thunder, lightning, and God has given them a spokesperson, Moses, who is speaking to them so that they can bear to hear from him. He comes down shining faced and he's telling them their story, who they are, who God is, where this is going. Remember, 400 years they've been living as slaves in the most powerful nation in the world at that time. They're hearing all about the gods of Egypt. They're hearing about Pharaoh, Pharaoh who himself would wear a mask for ceremonial purposes that was a, a picture of a falcon head, Horus, who's a god. Pharaoh was called the image of God because he was a picture of God with them. He himself was expected to be worshipped and obeyed as a god. And what kind of a, a, a god, a lowercase g god, was Pharaoh? He's one who sat on a throne and told his subjects what to do. And they did all of the work. They have no days of rest. They are working. The Israelites would work and work and work. And their cries and their sufferings went up to heaven. And the Lord heard and he knew. So he came and rescued them. He was committed to them already. But they had forgotten that this was their story. That they had a God who cared for them. Who had made promises to them. Who would bless them. Bless those who bless them. And those who dishonored them, he would curse. They had forgotten the story that in them all the families of the earth would be blessed. They didn't know this story, many of them. They were a people who had lived so long under servitude. They probably had deep questions. Where is God? Who are we? Is there any point? Just slaves in Egypt. And God came and rescued them. And the Lord, Yahweh, who comes and reveals himself, himself to them there at that mountain, who delivered them out of slavery miraculously, he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. But he's not some local deity. He's not just a God like the gods of Egypt that the Lord had just routed. He had just given them an, an ultimate shellacking. He's not like them. We find in Genesis 1-1, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the one who in the beginning made all things. He is the one true and living God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is your God. This is one who just redeemed you. So they begin getting to know God, having been redeemed. And what kind of a God is this? He's the main character in this story after all. What kind of a God is he? Is he like Pharaoh? Well, actually he works. Six days he works. He dignifies the thing that they do. Your work matters. Your work is good. God worked even before you and gave you a pattern for life to reflect him in the world. After all, that's what he made you to do and to be. What did it say in verse 26 of chapter one of Genesis? God said, let us make man or humankind. Hebrew, Hebrew word Adam just means humankind. It can be used as a, a proper name like Adam, the first historical man. 
But here, God is just saying, let us make humankind in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. <coughs> and so what does God do then? So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The first thing that I want you to see as we think about this scene one, wide angle panorama view of creation in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, the first thing I want us to see from our story, and this is the story of all humanity, not just the story of God's redeemed people, but the story of humanity is that all people, male and female, are made in God's image. All people, male and female, have dignity and value. And it's because God says so, and God made you so. Before all the strife entered into the world, before cultural enmity walked into the world, before all the ways in which people started to harm one another and stomp on each other and Pharaoh lorded over people and made them slaves, before all of that, God had declared in a way that can never be challenged, all people, are made in my image, God says. They have dignity and value. And this is not because simply of what they do. Realize that. Any more than God is simply to be valued for what he does. He never needed to create anything. And he would still be worthy of our pray, praise. On the, on the seventh day, the Lord rested from his work. He saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. He is worthy of our praise, even in himself. And for the record, the Lord resting was for us. The Sabbath was made for man. The Lord truly never rests. Otherwise, all creation itself would cease to exist because we exist by his word. So God made man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. He gives them dignity. First thing I want you to note then, all people made in his image, they have glorious purpose. Glorious purpose. Look at this. What did he say? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is often called the cultural mandate uh, by Bible nerds, the cultural mandate. Because from this human family and from their faithful fruit bearing, their faithful multiplying, and their dominion, they're doing good work wherever God called them in their little plots of earth. Culture was born and spread into the world. And what was that culture supposed to be like? It's supposed to reflect God. So the work that we do on the little plots of earth is supposed to have a global implication because as we multiply and as we teach our children, as we show those around us an image of who God is, the vision is that this earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is the Lord's original creation vision for humanity. And in the beginning, it was very good. And in the beginning, it all looked like everything was going well. God was going to, though, no matter what, commit himself to his creation. This is the kind of God that he is. He is a covenant-keeping God. Covenant is a Bible word for a special kind of relationship a relationship biblically between God and his people. God is the one who sets the terms of the relationship, and we're the ones who are welcome to experience all of that relationship's blessings, but are also expected to respond to our part in the relationship, to the obligations that we have in this covenant. In this first covenant that God makes with Adam, we'll speak about in just a moment, it's a covenant of life. 
upon Adam's obedience. Adam was expected to actually obey the Lord. In the broadest sense, his responsibility was to show the world who God is in everything that he did. In the narrowest sense, he had one prohibition. He had every provision that you could imagine, every lavish good, every delight. But one thing the Lord said he could not have. So the Lord God, we find in scene two, in Genesis 2.15, he takes this first created man, we zoom in from that wide angle view to a narrow view of the sixth day. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. To work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Lavish provision, one prohibition. One thing we might note, though, as we see the Lord made this covenant with Adam. Hosea 6, 7 speaks of this covenant made with Adam, one that you broke, Hosea says. Because we have all broken this expectation to obey the Lord and to image who he is faithfully. But in this covenant, the man was given a good purpose in local dirt. And this is the pattern again. The Lord has global purpose, but he calls us to local dirt in that global purpose. Small things, ordinary love. I mention this because I want you to realize something. In the beginning, God made Adam, and he made him to work and to rest, doing ordinary things. He was naming animals. The sixth day was busy, named a lot of animals. He was called to care for them. He was called to serve the garden and to keep it. That word for work can also be rendered to serve. To serve the good of this place that God has made, this good, beautiful, perfect place, flowing with waters, full of riches of gold. He was called to serve it and to keep it or to guard it. To guard it from things like talking snakes. Which we'll see that he failed to do. I mention this because before the fall, before sin entered into the world, your ordinary work mattered. And it was a part of God's plan to fill the earth with an image of his glory. And this is one of the graces that has been sustained even through the fall. One of those creational goods that is still good. It's good to do good work. That's why we feel good when we do a job and we do it well, right? Because it's good to do good work. Even the ordinary small things. So whether you are a student and you're calling your work that God's given you in this time of life is to learn... You wonder, how can I have great, glorious, global purpose? Well, in your local dirt, in your local classroom, you can faithfully image forth God, a God who's creative, a God who not only made all things, but loves all things. He knows them with affection. And so you can get to know God's world and God's creation and know it with affection, care about the things you learn about. I, I, I will confess, in Spanish class, I was like the worst kid. I would, I would make fun of all the things that we were doing. I'd, I'd, I'd talk when the teacher was talking and make fun. I, I, it is a shame that I don't know Spanish well. Like three classes in high school, no, four classes in high school, three in college. I didn't realize that that was a place that I could worship God by learning Spanish. In your relationship, in your marriage, in your workplaces as you grow. And you might say, oh, that's just idealistic. I can't try to start imaging forth who God is in my work. I, I need to make sales, right? So, you know, I'm just going to do what I got to do to sell what I got to sell. Well, the Christian doesn't say that. The Christian says, my work is a part of my image bearing is a part of me participating with God in showing forth God's glory to the world. 
I want to take a note now to talk about love. Ordinary work and ordinary love. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. Verse 18, I'll make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God, he formed every beast of the field and he brings them to the man. And you, you might know the story. He names them all. None of them are the right fit. But the Lord then caused Adam to rest. And he took his rib from his side. And he caused this rib and his divine power to become a woman who was fit for Adam. That word for fit for, which is repeated several times in the passage, it, it suggests being eye to eye, standing in front of someone who's truly fit to help Adam. Male and female, he created them in his image, equal in dignity. And this word for helper, some of us might find offensive, ladies, you might find it offensive that um, the Lord has created you as a helper for a man. But think of the dignity of the fact that God himself, the Holy Spirit, is called the helper. Jesus says, I'll send a helper. He'll lead you into all the truth. This is the Holy Spirit, God himself. Male and female, he created them for love relationship, fit together. And the first poem then is uttered by Adam, the first poem uttered by human lips. Verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we see the beginning of the first marriage, male and female brought together as one flesh. The man holding fast to his wife, naked and not ashamed. And this is the beautiful way through which the Lord would cause humanity to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. Both people who are people who believe in God and people who as a result of the fall and all of our folly and sin would reject God would yet have access to this creational good and this grace of marriage. It is a gift. I do wanna note though for, for folks who are single and for folks who are married, you need to hear it too. Adam in his created state was single unto the Lord. Eve, for a moment, though it was a moment, in her created state was single unto the Lord. Jesus Christ, single. In this story, there is room, there is a place, not only for the married, but also for the single. In fact, Isaiah 54 speaks of the great hope that's coming in the coming Messiah that those who are barren, those who could not bear, would bear even more children than those who could because they would be participating in God's family. And they could mentor younger people. They could raise many young ones in God's living room and in his church. And this is no second rate sort of parenthood. This is the family of God. So singleness is something that God calls some people to. The ordinary paradigm is marriage, fruitful marriage, faithful marriage between one man and one woman. So that's the first and the second scene of creation. We see God, this covenant keeping, this relational God making humankind for relationship with himself. He's made all things good, he doesn't make junk and he doesn't junk what he's made. And that is good news because in Genesis 3, the third scene, everything falls apart and humanity messes everything up. There's a new character, the serpent comes in, who is more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said, note those words, he said, red flag, the serpent is talking, Adam, you who are called to work and to keep the garden, the serpent is talking. And he's not just talking, he's talking smack on God. And he questions God. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Adam had related to her, the Lord's command. He had added perhaps a little bit to it, perhaps to even put more distance between themselves 
and breaking that command. It's something that the Pharisees would later do in Jesus' day, adding to the Lord's commands out of fear of breaking them. In any case, the serpent then said to the woman, you will not surely die. He directly contradicts God. What did God say? He said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent does what he does even today, what he's done in every age. He recasts the story that you're in so that no longer is God the hero, but God is actually the villain God is stingy, and he is just trying to hide this perfect, good, sweet knowledge from you. And if you would just know what he knew, he could tell you, but he won't. If you just knew what he knew, then you could be like God. You could know good and evil. He wants to hide pleasure from you. He doesn't want you to be happy like he is. And so this seed of doubt in God grows quickly And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. The one who was called to work and to guard God's garden stood there while the talking snake questioned God, deliberately calls God a liar and lies to his wife. He stands by, lets all that happen without making a move. Any farmer worth his salt by this point has chopped that snake's head off. But he doesn't do a thing. If it wasn't a talking snake, you could just pick it up and throw it out of your yard. But talking snakes, sorry. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, hiding themselves in shame because they realized something about themselves that they were never supposed to experience. God never intended for them to live in this way, to have to hide themselves, to know themselves as sinful. That didn't have to be. God had promised them life and every goodness If only they would need of the one tree, and then they did that. So it's a wonder that man would turn against God, his creator, who would walk with him in the cool of the day, who cared for him and lavished him with every goodness, who gave him purpose and meaning, who called him a fellow, who called humankind his image bearer. That's a wonder, but the greater wonder is that there is a Genesis 3.8 that the story didn't end, that the Lord who made all things and darn well could unmake all things didn't because he saw all that he had made was good. He loved all that he had made. He so loved the world that he would commit himself in covenant promise. And this promise would be different. Whereas in this first moment of humanity, God promised life on the condition of Adam's obedience. In this gracious covenant that's coming, the Lord would fulfill all the requirements himself. All of the obligations he would carry himself. And so we hear him coming in mercy to his children. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, graciously calling him out where he is. Where are you? Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid suddenly, the first time, being afraid at the Lord approaching, because I was naked and I hid myself. And the Lord says, Who told you you were naked? You know, who are you listening to? Who is telling you who you are now? Who is telling you how to live in my world? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Did you hear what he did subtly there? The woman you gave me. (laughs) 
And the Lord turns to the woman. What is this you've done? The woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord at this point does something so surprising. He offers promise. Promise and a curse to the one who just tempted his image bearers. The first proclamation of the gospel comes in a curse to the serpent. The Lord says in verse 14 of chapter 3, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The first proclamation of the gospel the Lord would still raise up an offspring. This creational goodness of a fruitful bearing of children will continue. And through that means, the Lord would bring a savior who would crush the head of the serpent, who himself would take on the pain of the fall, his heel bruised. There's grace offered to the world that turned against God. That's an amazing thing. That's the kind of God who's the hero of this story that we find ourselves in. There's difficulty because the sin broke everything, beginning with these relationships, the woman and her relationship to childbearing and to her husband. Now there's domination in marriage where there should be service. Now there is pain in childbearing. Now there are stillborn children. Now there is all sorts of terrible grief instead of the joy God created us to know. You see, when God created humankind as his image bearer, we were like priests over God's earth, representing God to the world around us. And when that first priest fell, Adam and his wife. That curse affected everything that they were called to serve, not just themselves. And so the creation itself groans, as Romans 8 says. So the woman receives this curse, and yet the dignified promise of continuing to be a part of God's plan, raising up children. And Adam would receive the, the curse of his work, not returning what it used to. The soil will not return anything to him. He'll get thorns and thistles. Work is frustrating. Workplace politics arise. By the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread till you return to the ground. And this is the worst of it. God created us to know life. And through sin, death came into the world. You'll return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust. And to dust you shall return, the Lord says. In Genesis 3.19. But even in the midst of all of that sorrow, in the midst of all the fallenness and the rebellion, the Lord continues to show his grace. The Lord God made for Adam, remember they're hiding themselves in shame, trying to cover themselves. He makes for them garments of skins and clothed them. Did you see that? In verse 21, he clothes them. Where does he get clothes? Where do you get skins? He doesn't go to, you know, the department store. There was a sacrifice. There was an animal that gave its life to clothe them. And it's just a tiny picture of what is yet to come. The true and the greater Adam, the one who would have his heel bruised to crush the head of the serpent, to save us, to cover us with all of his righteousness. Jesus. His grace would be sustained. It would never quit, even through it all, even through all of his people's rebellion in every age, down even to us. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. I'll just briefly summarize some of these verses. Another great chapter on Christ as the second Adam is 1 Corinthians 15, but I'm not going to spend time there today. You can go read that later. But Paul says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, 
Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For the record, between verses 12 and 18, Paul goes on a long parenthesis, which, which he does often. That's why Peter says that Paul is hard to understand in 2 Peter. Uh, and this is a difficult passage. But certainly what is clear in this passage is that Adam messed up everything. Through his one act of disobedience, sin and death entered the world. And that sin and that death has affected everyone without exception. We're under that curse. But even more than what his one trespass did, Jesus Christ, the true and greater Adam, the perfect human, fully God, fully man, in his one act of righteousness, think of his whole life, <laughs> one constant reflection of God, he himself is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In his one Offering of his life in our place leads to justification and life for all men. He would cover us with his perfect holiness and righteousness so that we could approach God in safety as sons and daughters, loved, free. No more shame. This is what Jesus did for us. To right what Adam did wrong, to fulfill the obligations of the covenant that humanity broke and could never fulfill again. Jesus came and fulfilled it all. Christ, the second and greater Adam. He himself, as we've read together earlier, is the image of the invisible God. And he came to image who God is for the sake of all creation. Because he cares about it all. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He does not make junk and he doesn't junk what he's made. In him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself what? All things. Everything that was broken by the fall. Far as the curse is found. The Lord Jesus' grace would go further still to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus, the great, the true Adam, who, as we look to him with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Second Corinthians 3.18. We are invited now, broken image bearers, to come to Jesus. And it's like, this perfect true image, who we have no right to approach him. He, he dwells in unapproachable light, and yet he would come into our darkness, and he would pick up every broken, shattered piece of the image that he created us to show the world, and he would put it all back together as we look to him. He will make you more fully human. And so in your workplaces, where you're just bored, or where you don't care, where you don't see the point, you can be a part of God's purpose to show who he is to your neighbor. He will transform you from one degree of glory to another to reflect who he is so that you can be truly human as you were made to be. In your relationships and in your marriage where there is fighting, fighting over the silliest of things, fighting's over the most profound betrayals, you can find restoration, and the Lord can piece you together. There's hope. In your singleness and in your waiting, in your widowhood, there is hope and purpose in the new creation family of God. That's what we are. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Y'all, pay attention to the you plurals. Y'all, <laughs> y'all are a new creation, church looking to Christ Jesus. He's repiecing you together, making you what he meant you to be. And we even get to participate in the great undoing of all that went wrong. Romans 16, 20, we find that Satan's days are numbered. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, Paul says to the church in Rome. In Christ, we will participate in that first promise being fulfilled. You will crush his head. He will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. 
We will participate in the Son of God, crushing Satan under our feet. The good news goes further, though, because the story is not over. The brokenness of the world will be made right. And we see this in in perhaps the greatest extra that we have in this movie script of the Bible. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the heartbeat and the hope of the scriptures, God with us. This is why we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. That means, O come, O come, God with us. Jesus is God with us, and one day, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will dwell with us in his glory. Notice heaven coming to earth. And notice Verse 5, he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. The one who made all things good does not make junk, and he doesn't junk what he's made. He makes all things new. He is a God of restoration, a God who renews, bringing heaven to earth, establishing his kingdom with us forever. And we see that garden glory recovered, and even more in this new city the Lord will bring. The angel showed me the river, chapter 22, verse 1. The river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, the tree that Adam and his wife were forbidden to eat because they would have continued forever in sin if they should have eaten from it. So they were cast out of the garden. But here in the garden city, forevermore will enjoy its fruit. Twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They'll see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. And this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever and ever. What is your story, Faith Church? What's the story that you're a part of? How would you share that with a neighbor? You're a part of a story of hope. You're a part of the story of hope because God, who created all things, created even you for a relationship with him, a relationship that he would never quit on. He is so intent on restoring all things and even restoring you that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die to take the curse on himself and to rise in victory, to welcome you to be remade in his image, your image bearing restored, every fragment put back into place in time. And one day God will restore all things and make all the unbroken things right again. You have a story of hope to tell and to live in. And so in this Christmas season that's coming, a season that brings with it incredible joys, but also some of the greatest sadnesses for some of us. As we remember loved ones who aren't at the table, as we experience relational damage, when we look on Facebook and see other people posting selfies of all of their relational warmth and goodness, and we live in a world that is post-Genesis 3, but we live in a world that has offered the greatest story of hope that any of us could ever imagine. So I pray you would take hold of that today. I pray that you would realize your hope in Jesus and take hold of him and behold him. And he will transform you from one degree of glory to another to be like himself. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this great story of hope. Thank you that you've offered Jesus so that this story isn't a meaningless cacophony of sound and fury. We don't have to wonder whether there is a hero, you've proven your love for us. You've proven your might and your strength. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you, Lord, 
We just pray you'd make us more like him. Help us to share his story with our neighbors. For those who have questions and doubts about this story, I pray that you would invite them, welcome them, that you would just help people to encounter you in your truth and in your glory and grace. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen.